Are you excited about eating a lot of turkey, a lot of stuffing, a lot of, uh, a lot of food? <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's when you feast, right? Thanksgiving is when you, feasting in other terms is pigging out, basically. <laughs> That's when we, we just eat, right? And uh, so maybe in the next couple of days, you know, maybe take it a little bit lighter so that you can go full on on, on Thursday. And um, so, but it's not just about the food, right? It's about family. It's about celebrating. And uh, I have a, a, my favorite Thanksgiving, I'm sure everybody has a story, but my favorite Thanksgiving um, was in 1999, was my favorite Thanksgiving. Because on Thursday, Thanksgiving of uh, 1999, the, we, we celebrated, and, but, uh, but we didn't have turkey, actually. We had uh, something better than turkey. We had el pollo loco. No. You're saying, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It, I'm telling you, it was the best Thanksgiving I've ever had. And uh, it wasn't even turkey. It was el pollo loco. It was uh, el crazy chicken, crazy chicken. And uh, I tell you, it was the best one because that's the day that we moved into our new home, into our home, that is our home right now. So that was our first house, and it was the day that we moved in. So uh, we were, at that time, we were at the Andrews Temple. We were at the church that we were, basically, where we accepted Christ. And so we had a couple of brothers from the church, a couple of the youth came and helped us move that day. So we moved into our home, and um, it was uh, the best Pollo Loco Thanksgiving celebration that I have ever had. So I know it's not actually about the food, but it's about the moments that we enjoy, right? So I want to encourage you this week to make it memorable. I want you to make it memorable this, this week. I want, I want to encourage you that it, would, it won't just be another Thanksgiving, but it would be a time where you're, you're, you can think about all the things that God has done in your life and that you can rejoice in this season and thank God for what he is doing in your life and what he's going to do. I really believe that God has good things prepared for us. I really believe that. I really, I believe that God is, uh, he's, he's, we serve a God is, that is creative. Even though maybe your life up to this point hasn't been that creative. <laughs> maybe you think, you know what, I've, my life hasn't been that. Uh, but I believe God is, is really a God of the now, but he's also a God of the, what's in front of us. Because I don't need faith for what I've already been through. I don't need faith for that, right? It's already in the past. I need faith for what's coming up next. I need faith for what God wants to do next in my life. And the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because I think the one thing that pleases God is faith. When we just have faith and we're expecting, we, have, we anticipate what God wants to do in our lives. And so some people anticipate problems. Some people anticipate you know, conflict. Some people anticipate, oh, you know, oh, I know, you know, something bad's going to happen. Well, I don't anticipate any of that. I anticipate the good things of the Lord because the Bible says that his favor is for an entire lifetime. How many believe that the favor of God is for a lifetime? Amen? So let's anticipate and let's believe God for better things and for great things. And if you're experiencing difficulties today, well, I want to encourage you today to believe that God has something better for you. If you're having health issues today, I want to believe God with you, that God can heal you. Amen? We believe in a God that can heal us. If you're facing difficulty in your finances, well, I believe God can restore your finances. If you're dealing with family issues, God can restore your family as well. But let's make it a point to, or let's make it a point to, uh, to, to seize on every opportunity that God gives us. And today is an opportunity. Amen? Being alive today is an opportunity. You're not just existing today. You're not just, you didn't, just, just didn't wake up this morning and, and you were breathing and that's all I'm doing. I'm just breathing and this. And you know, we're not, we don't believe in zombies, right? But some people actually live like a zombie because they just get up and, you know, oh, I'm just going through the motions and there's no life. Come on. There is, there is goodness in this day today. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. And you make a choice to rejoice and to be glad in the day that God has made. So I'm going to seize every opportunity. I'm going to seize every opportunity. So not every opportunity has to do with money. Not, any, not every opportunity has to do with maybe, you know, things that we're wishing for necessarily. But just the fact that we're alive today, the fact that you have your children or you have family around you, it's, 
an opportunity. So this Thanksgiving, I want to encourage you to take the opportunity to be glad in the Lord and to rejoice. And there's three things that I believe the Lord put in my heart to share with you about Thanksgiving. And I'll, I'll mention quite a few things, but three things that I want it to stay in your mind. And, and I want you to think about this week. The first one is, is let this be a time to reconcile. Let this be a, type, a, a, a time to reconcile. Because this may be an opportunity uh, where you're going to have to be with people that you haven't seen for a while. Or maybe it's going to be an opportunity to see maybe family or friends or people that maybe, you know, you haven't completely restored and reconciled relationships with them. And so it's a time to reconcile, to reconcile when we come at the table. And we have a perfect example in the table of the Lord. You know, we have the first of the month, we put a table here and we celebrate what's called the Lord's table. And this Lord's table, it's what we call communion as well. And we serve a little cup, which is uh, uh, grape juice that we put in that little cup. And then we have a little piece of a bread. And uh, the bread represents the body of Christ and the cup represents the blood of Jesus. And Jesus told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Every time that you meet, do this in remembrance of me. And do this as often as you meet and celebrate, you know, the, my, my death. And Paul says we celebrate the Lord's death until he returns. So when we come to the table, it, this table is a place of reconciliation. We reconcile with God. We reconcile people to God. Maybe we've come at that table and we just don't feel like we're worthy of the table. We're, we don't feel like we're worthy as Christians. As Maybe we feel like we haven't lived up to the standard of God in our lives. But when we come to that table, that's the place where we're invited to reconcile with God. And we do that. So I want to encourage you that this Thanksgiving, make it a place of reconciliation. Make, make it a place where you reconcile things with people. I remember there was a, a, a lady one time that came to me because she had issues with her daughter. She had a problem with her daughter. And, uh, and let me just be bold and tell you what the problem she had with her daughter. She had a problem with her daughter because her daughter had chosen to be a lesbian. And that's why she had a, an issue with her daughter. She would fight with her. She would resist her. And, you know, she, wasn't, she had never reconciled that, that my daughter has chosen to be and to have this lifestyle. And so, you know, they would always fight. And her daughter would invite her mom to her house to eat dinner. And her mom would say, I would, I'm never going to go to your house because I don't accept how you're living. And I don't, I don't accept that. Now, we can have our views, and I have my views about uh, the, the, the lifestyle. But here's the thing. One day she came to me and she said, Pastor Joe, she says, I don't know what to do because I, I just can't deal with it. I just can't deal with that. I just don't accept it. And there was this conflict between them. And... Uh, they were always fighting. And so one day I said, well, why don't you invite her to come and let's meet with her. Let's invite her, bring her to the office. Maybe she's willing to come to the office. And so they did. The mom and the daughter came to my office. And, uh, you know, here she is. And uh, she probably thought, oh, man, they're going to get me now. Pastor Joe's going to get me in. And, you know, it, it wasn't about getting anybody and it wasn't about preaching to her. It wasn't about any of that. It was about reconciling a mom and a daughter. That's what it was all about, reconciling them. And so that was my whole purpose. And at the end of the day, we did that. They reconciled with each other. Because I told the mom, I said, the best way that you can influence your daughter is by loving her. By really loving her as, as a mom. You're not just because she's chosen to do this. You're still her mom. And you still have influence. And you can still love her. And that's what they did. And so after that, she was able to visit her at home. The mom was able to visit the daughter at home and have and sit at the table with her without having those things get in between. And there was reconciliation. And see, that's what I'm encouraging you to do this week, to reconcile with people that maybe you don't agree with, to reconcile with people that maybe you have different points of view. Maybe you're not going to go out and, 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 and just embrace what they're doing and say, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm all for that, Right? But you're going to reconcile. And that's important as Christians that we understand that because we've been reconciled with God. See, we've been forgiven. We've been loved in spite of what we've done. We've been loved by God in spite of our sins and the things that even now as Christians, even now we do. And God, you know, still opens the table for us to come and, and enjoy the table. So 
I want to encourage you to make it a place of reconciliation. That when you sit at the table this week with whoever you sit with, because Jesus sat with all kinds of people, and he was criticized for that. He would bring at the table, the Bible says that he sat at the table with sinners and with prostitutes and with people that everybody despised. Jesus sat at the table with them. So let's not make it a place of conflict. Let's not make it a place where we, ex where we uh, uh, announce our views. But let's make it a place of reconciliation. And let's win people for Christ that way. Amen? So reconciliation. Let's make it also a place. I want to encourage you uh, in Thanksgiving to make it also a place of re recommitting. To re recommit. A place of commitment. See, at the table is a place where we can re recommit to people and to relationships. It's a place where we can find, 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 uh, find an opportunity to recommit to the values that we hold at that place, at the table. See, it's a, an opportunity to, for example, when we meet someone at the table, we can recommit to win them for Christ. See, this is an opportunity. That's why we invited the church last week. We said, if you would open your home, if you would host some people in your house, it's an opportunity to reach out to somebody. See? And so when we recommit it's an opportunity for us to restart again those relationships and those places where we can once again make an opportunity or take advantage of the opportunity to recommit to values that we have. One of the values that we have is to serving one another. See, Jesus, for example, one, in one opportunity, the Bible says that he went to this house and they invited him to sit at the table. They invited him and the disciples to sit at the table in that place. And while they were sitting there, they realized that they had not, their feet hadn't been washed, which was a custom that they had at the time. When they went into a house, because they didn't have the paved roads like we have today, they were dirt roads. And so whenever they walked from one place to another, their feet would become dirty. And it was a, 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 it was a, a, a custom and it was a, a habit that if you went into someone's house out of respect for the household, you would allow the servant of the house to come and wash your feet. So you walk into that place, into someone's house, there would be a servant that would come and would wash your feet so that you would go into that place. And it was, a, it was a, an honoring thing to wash somebody's feet or to have your feet washed. But in this particular instance, when they came to that place and they sat at the table, it didn't happen. Their feet hadn't, hadn't been washed. So Jesus, while he's sitting there, he realizes that, you know what? Our feet weren't washed. So Jesus took it upon himself to... To, to serve the rest of the disciples. And what did he do? Got out of his chair, pulled over to a basin of water, which was reserved for the servant to wash the feet of the, the guests. He took the towel, and he began to wash the feet of the rest of the disciples. Now, that surprised everybody because that wasn't something that he was supposed to do. The servant was supposed to do that, not him. He was the guest of honor. As a matter of fact, he was the highest level of authority as a rabbi in that place. He was the one that should be honored first. But Jesus was also using the opportunity to teach his disciples about the one of our values, which is to serve. We are called to serve one another. Regardless of how high, how important, how prestigious our position becomes, as a matter of fact, the highest level of position we could ever get, it just means that we have to be even a greater servant to others. And so he Gets out of his chair, pulls the, pulls the, the vase of water and then the, the, the towel, and he begins to ready himself to wash the feet of the disciples. And he begins to do that. And Peter says, wait a minute, you can't do that. That's not your job. I should be washing your feet. But see, Jesus was committed to that value of serving one another. I believe that Thanksgiving, it's an opportunity for us to serve one another. There are people around us that we could serve. There are people around us that we could make a difference in their lives. There are people around us that we can really win over for the kingdom of God if we would just serve them. If we would just serve them. I want to encourage you as a church in, as this season 
Thanksgiving begins a season, the Christmas season and all that. You know, it's about going to the mall and those huge lines and going to those, you know, the, the shops where you can't even walk through and all that. I mean, it, all of that's part of it. But that's not the reason for the season, right? The reason for the season is Jesus. And so let's begin this season by serving others. Let's find every opportunity that we can. Let's take advantage of every opportunity that we can to serve one another. I want to encourage you to reconcile. Let it be a place of reconciliation, but it, let it also be a place where you recommit to your values and the value of serving one another. And when we do that, we also go to the third thing that I want to encourage you to do, which is to restore, restoration. Reconciliation, recommitment, and restoration. Let this time be a time of reconciling people, recommitting to the values that we have, and to restoring. See, when Jesus began to wash the feet of the disciples, Peter said, no, you can't do that because you're the, you're the main guy here. You're the leader. I should be the one washing your feet. The good thing about Jesus is he was secured. See, he, he, he knew that nobody could take anything away from him or even anything that he did wouldn't take away from who he was. See, that's, I think, the level of security that God wants us to have, where you're not afraid of people competing with you, where you're not looking to your side and say, is he coming or is she coming? You know, I got to get ahead. No, you just would trust God for your life, that you would just trust the Lord that he has, he'll take care of you, that you don't have to bump anybody off the ride. You don't have to bump anybody off the train and says, you know, and, and, and do all that, that you know that God has a plan for you just like he has a plan for the other person. And if, if we know that, then we can serve one another in confidence. Because I can then help my brother become everything that God intended him to be. I can do everything that's in my part to help him succeed. See, because I'm not afraid that, well, what if he succeeds more than I do? What if he gets there before I do? See, Jesus didn't think that. Jesus knew who he was, and he was confident. And so when Peter said, no, you shouldn't do that, Jesus said, listen, Peter, I need to do this. He said, because not only do I have to wash your feet, but I have to completely cleanse you. See, that's restoration. And that's the power that we have. We can restore people to wholeness. Your words can restore people to wholeness. Your actions can restore people to wholeness. Your attitude can restore people to wholeness. You are... In God, a mighty, powerful person. That's what we sang today when we said, in you I can do all things. I can do anything. It's not talking about, you know, I can build companies. I can go and get this and I can go and get that. It's not talking about that. It's the power that we have in the Holy Spirit to restore somebody else's life. You know, there's people out there that are hurting right now. People out there that are, that, that are needing a word, that are needing your encouragement. And sometimes we, we just... We, we kind of shy away from that and say, no, I, I, I can't do that. See, God has enabled you. Last night I had the opportunity to minister to someone on the phone. I ministered to someone that I hadn't talked to for almost seven, eight years. And uh, the reason I had called him was because I needed somebody to do some work, and I knew he did that kind of work. And so I got his number through somebody, and I called him. I didn't realize everything that had happened to him. And the conversation turned from this work that I wanted him to do to spending almost an hour and a half talking to him, encouraging him, and hopefully lifting him up, hopefully giving him hope again. See, someone who had served God, someone that been connected and been active in the church and, you know, his whole family doing the work of God and doing the things of God, all of a sudden away from God, all of a sudden away from the things of God. And it hurt me to see him in that situation. It hurt me to see that he was going through that. But I knew, and, and it was very difficult because it was almost like he was saying, there's no hope for me. I've talked to pastors, and, you know, I, nobody's been able to help me. That's what I was getting. And so for a moment I thought, what can I do? I can't do anything. But then all of a sudden I began to know and say, you know what, I, I can't do something for him. I can say something for him. And, and I just began to speak in authority, and I began to speak in, 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 in what I know God has put in my heart, and I began to speak to him. 
restoration. Because that's what people need. See, let's seize every opportunity. Let's seize every opportunity. Let's not waste this season. Let's not just let this season go by. And then, you know, it's just another Thanksgiving. It's just another Christmas. No, I believe that God can use you in this season. See, this season is a time to restore. It's a time to reconcile. It's a time to recommit to the values that we hold dearly. Let's take advantage of this season. This week when you sit at the Thanksgiving table, remember you're coming home and you're going to embrace the family. And see, many people that might be sitting, there might be people sitting at your table that don't have their family with them. So it's an opportunity for us to embrace them. Maybe somebody's not even looking forward to Thanksgiving. I remember before I got saved, before I became a Christian, I used to dread the holidays. Thanksgiving didn't mean anything to me. Christmas did not mean anything to me because I didn't have my family with me. I lost my mother. I lost, never, had my, never, never had my father. So when everybody would say, we're going to go and celebrate, we're going to spend time with family, I didn't have family. So when I became a Christian, everything changed because now I had a family. I had a big family. I have a huge family now. Praise the Lord. So now I look forward to it. But there's people that don't look forward to it because they feel alone. See, this is a time to reconcile, to reconnect, to recommit, to restore. Let me read a verse of scripture that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this teaching up through what some advice that we get from the Apostle Paul. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is talking about the Lord's table. But one of the things that I like to suggest this week. Now, if you can do communion, do communion this week. If you can do communion before you actually have Thanksgiving dinner, do communion. If you say, Pastor Joe, we love to do communion, but we don't have the elements, we'll help you. If you would like to do that, we'll provide the elements for you. We'll provide the, the, the little cups so that you can do that. You can do it yourself. You can do it yourself. See, all you need is some cups, some grape juice, and maybe just the bread that you cut in pieces. That's all you need. Now, does it have to be one particular bread? One for You know what? If, if, if I was stuck in the desert for many, many years and I didn't have no, you know, no Walmart to go to get some grape juice, then we just choose the water that's right there. You know, that's how we would celebrate communion. But I'm going to encourage you to do that this week. See, the Apostle Paul says about the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. Now, he says, in giving these instructions, now he's getting on their case. And simply, the reason he's getting in their case is because they've made just a, a, they made just a party out of communion. That's what they made out of it, you know. They made a party out of it. They just, you know, it was just, let's just go over there and just let's, you know, they, they had lost the meaning of communion. So he he, he gives an exhortation, and he says, Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worst. So this week, let's not come for the worst. Let's come for the better. And the better part is to reconcile, to reconnect, to recommit, to restore. That's the best part of it. Sadly, sometimes when people get together with family, what happens? They fight. You know, because so-and-so said this or because there's already, somebody already has some kind of resentment about what happened last time and this and that. And that's not the reason. Let's not come together for the worst. Let's come together for the better. Everybody say with me. We're not going to come together for the worst. We're going to come together for the better, for the best. The apostle says, since you come together not for the better but for the worst. But he says, but first, for first of all, when you come together as a church, he says, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. He says, there's divisions among you. There shouldn't be any divisions. That's why I give the example of this lady who was divided with her daughter because she was completely offended by what her daughter had done and the lifestyle that he, she had chosen. She was offended by that. But by being offended, she wasn't going to change anything. By being offended, she wasn't going to make a difference. 
by being offended, she couldn't love this person. And so at the end, she realized, you know what? I can still love her. Even though she's chosen that, I can still love her. She's my daughter. They were reconciled. The Bible says that in the church, there could be divisions. You would think that that shouldn't be the case, right? You would think that the church should be the most united place in the whole world. That the church would be the place where everybody just loves one another and they have fellowship and they just, but it doesn't happen. Why? Because people want to make their point. This shouldn't be like this. This should be like that. But this is not the time for us to be divided. This is the time for us to come together. The apostle says, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? In other words, when you come together for that, when you have this opportunity, and when we have such an opportunity where you're going to have family that you haven't seen for years, you have friends that you may haven't seen for a long time, you're going to be with people in this season that you may not be with for another year. You may be around people, you may be sitting with people that you're not going to see for a while. So take advantage of the opportunity. Be intentional about the opportunity. Be intentional to love, to restore, to recommit to the values that God has given you. So when you come together, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper, he says? For in eating, it says, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry and another one is drunk. So basically, it was just a big old party for them. And they weren't caring for one another while they were doing this. They were just like, you know what, let me get in line. It was funny, we, we, we were, on Friday night, we were giving away hot chocolate. And we gave away almost 800 cups of hot chocolate. We had more than that. We had people come, more than that, that, come, that went through the, 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 the courtyard for the holiday in the park event. We had a jazz band. We, we, we lit up the place. <laughs> We were loud, and everybody showed up. It, it was awesome. So when we ran out of hot chocolate, some people got upset. So I heard, I don't know who it was. Ho- hopefully that person isn't here. If you're here, well, there he goes. Somebody got upset, so they, 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 they came in and said, where's the hot chocolate? I said, sorry, we ran out. They got mad, so they grabbed the paper that had the hot chocolate sign and Grabbed it, crumbled it, and threw it. You people didn't save me no hot chocolate. (laughs) It's funny how we get, right? Now, let me tell you that. I'll get like that at the Walmart line for that big 80-inch TV this weekend, all right? (laughs) Isn't that what we do, right? You know, you see it on the TV, right? As soon as they open Walmart, people just run in there, and they get run over and all that because we get... We get all into it, right? We forget. We forget. See, when there's a buffet, buffet of, you know, lots of food and everything, you know, we kind of just forget the other person. I mean, I want to go first. I want to grab my piece first. So that was, that's what was happening in the church. It was like Walmart. People going in there and saying, you know, and, and, you know, let me get my piece. And, you know, they completely forgot what this was all about. Let's not forget what this season is all about. It's not about big screen TVs. Although if you get a good deal, get a good deal, let me know about it. (laughs) But it's not about that. See, Jesus, we just sang and we said, Jesus, be the center of it all. Can we invite Jesus to the Thanksgiving dinner table this week? Can we invite Jesus to be at the center of the season this particular season? We can do that. See, for them, it wasn't like that. And so they began to kind of be disorderly at the Lord's table. And Paul says, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. He says, because when I received it from God, listen, when I received it from the Lord, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. 
that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. Verse 24, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as you are at the table of Thanksgiving this weekend, this week, remember the Lord. Let's remember the Lord. What he has done for us. All that he has done. All that he has done. Take a moment and say, Lord, I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. Because that's what it's all about. In the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. See, that's what sets you apart, that covenant. That's what sets you apart. You and I are no better than anybody else. As a matter of fact, if you're not careful, you can begin to think like you're just like everybody else. But you're not. What makes a difference is the covenant that you're a part of. See, because today you might be experiencing sickness in your body. And you say, well, you know what? Everybody gets sick, right? You know, as a matter of fact, right now, cancer is kind of going around. You know, everybody's getting it. So, I mean, I'm not surprised that I got it. I don't think anybody's saying that, by the way. But, that, but I want to remind you that you're part of a covenant. And the covenant says... By his stripes you were healed. That's what the covenant says. He provided for you on the cross. Everything that he went through on the cross wasn't so that we could just be as business as usual. Everything that he did for us on the cross was so that we could come to this place and at every opportunity that we get, we are reminded and we remember what he did for us on the cross. And then when we're there, we can say, thank you, Lord, because by your stripes, I am healed. Thank you, Lord, that you have a purpose for my life. Thank you, Lord, that you've ordained blessing and favor over my life. I am highly favored by God. I am blessed by the Lord. I have been chosen by God. I am a child of God because of the covenant that I will have with Jesus. See, that's what we're being reminded of today. It's not business as usual. This is a, a very special season. This is a very special time. And I am looking forward to what God has in store for all of us. I am looking forward to for what God has stored for my life. I am looking forward to what God has stored for my family. I am looking forward to that because I'm anticipating what God wants to do in my life. See, he, every time we come together and we celebrate together and we say, Jesus, be the center, we are reminded that it's not just business as usual. We're reminded that we serve a God that is awesome. We're reminded that we serve a God that is amazing. We're reminded that we serve a God that just loves us and cares for us and has provided for us and is, has something prepared for us. That's what we're reminded of when we come together. And we're seeing the miracles. And you can be a miracle as well. And a miracle can happen in your life as well. But we got to seize the opportunity. This is the time. Now, the last thing, verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. There's, there's a very, these are very difficult words, some of the most difficult words to read in the Bible. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, look at this. It says, examine yourself, but drink and eat. It doesn't say, examine yourself. And if you find something that's not good, don't eat. It doesn't say that. It means that it's exhorting us to do it but to do it in a worthy manner. It's telling us that when we approach this life, and see, to me, 
being a Christian is not about going to church on Sundays. To me, being a Christian and being a disciple is a lifestyle that we ought to live out in everything. We ought to live it out in our, our, our attitude. We ought to live it out in our words. We ought to live it out in everything that we do, in our actions. And so living in an unworthy manner means that our attitude stinks. That's what it means. Living in an unworthy manner, it means that our attitude completely stinks. And our attitude could completely stink in our marriage. We could be completely be like disgruntled and complaining about the other person, and hating on the other person or hating on somebody. That attitude stinks. And that's unworthy of the Lord. When we despise other people, when we forget what our purpose is, which is to serve others, to love others, when we start criticizing or judging somebody else, it's easy to do that, by the way. See, that's unworthiness. When we're divided amongst ourselves, that's unworthiness. Remember he began to talk to the church because they were kind of, they were doing everything in an unworthy manner. They showed up for the party, but they were not really thinking about their brothers and sisters. So to be worthy of the Lord, it just simply means that your attitude is in the right place. That your heart is in the right place. That you come in alignment with the will of God in your life. Where you come in alignment with the purpose of God for your life. When you come in alignment for, for what God wants to do in you and through you to touch somebody else. That's simply what it means. Because the reality is, all of us mess up, right? And so, if, if we started looking at every little thing that we did, we probably, maybe all of us would be unworthy. Oh, man, I messed up this week. I shouldn't have said that. How many times do we get, you know, we get angry with our kids and we say things we shouldn't say? How many times do we say something to somebody else and we regret what we said? But being worthy isn't necessarily that you don't make mistakes. Being worthy doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you're, you were unperfect this week. It's the manner in which we approach the table with the respect and the reverence that it deserves. And so I think we ought to do that every day of our lives. So whether you're showing up for a meeting at work and we're showing up to that meeting and we're going to sit at that table and there's somebody there from work that you just can't stand, right? There's somebody there that you just get, man, this guy just, he shouldn't be here. And we have an attitude with that person. And guess what? We sit at that table. That's an unworthy manner. Because Jesus is there too. See, religion says that the God that you serve is in the temple that you attend. That's what religion says. And so you go to the temple to worship the God of that temple. But we don't have religion. We have relationship. And Jesus, yes, we may come together in this house, in this building, but that's all it is. It's just a building. But the house that God wants to dwell is here in your heart. So we carry the presence of God wherever we go. We are the temple of God. So being worthy of God, being worthy of the table just means that my attitude is in the right place. I approach the table with humility. I approach situations with humility. I approach conflict with humility. I don't come over there and come with a bat and say, yeah, I'm going I'm to hit this guy's head and I'm going to break his head and I'm going to do that. That's unworthy of the table. But coming to every situation and every circumstance and you approach that with humility, recognizing that you can be on the other side of the receiving end of that, right? That you can be criticized, that you can be hated, that you can be the object of somebody else's hate, but you don't want that for you. You want to approach the table knowing that Jesus is going there with you. And you know what? Yeah, somebody may rise up against you, but remember the verse that we said last week where David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So when you come to the table with an attitude Saying, you know what, the Lord is in control. 
The Lord has control of the situation. He has, my life is in his hands. I'm not going to worry about this. I'm not going to be concerned about this. I'm going to approach this with humility because that's what's worthy of the God that I serve. Because he has control of my life. I don't have to fight anybody. I don't have to remind anybody how good I am. How much they stink. I don't have to do that. I could just approach things with humility and say, you know what? Just like you need God, I need God. Amen? Amen.